Dr. Cantalone and one of the educators at the University of Florida in conjunction with the Bergstrom Center for Real Estate Studies. And I would like to introduce to you your next speaker. Next speaker is uh, been a real estate developer, professional real estate developer for over 25 years in both corporate and entrepreneurial environments. Uh, has done a wide variety of projects including resort, hospitality, recreation, commercial, and community developments. Uh, he has been, he was the uh, vice president uh, of development for Starwood Hotels and Resorts here in Orlando. Uh, he was responsible for leading uh, the entitlements process for new uh, owned development projects worldwide prior to Starwood. He was the vice president for uh, development for intra-west placemaking, also here in Orlando. Where he was responsible for leading the acquisition and development of intra-west warm weather resorts uh, in the southeast United States and also in the Caribbean. Uh, prior to intra-west, he was the director of development uh, at Celebration Associates in Pinehurst, North Carolina. Where he was responsible for community and commercial development projects in North Carolina, South Carolina, and also Virginia. Uh, prior to Celebration Associates, he was the project director at Walt Disney World back here in Orlando at the Imagineering, uh, Walt Disney Imagineering. And uh, let's say he's currently the chairman of the Celebration Community Development District. Uh, was uh, the 2008 winner of Celebration Foundation's Todd Mansfield Leadership Award. He received his uh, BBA uh, in Minnesota, Minnesota Duluth. He is also a Gator, having earned an MBA from the University of Florida. He has a lovely wife of 27 years, Maria, and he has three children, one of whom I just discovered yesterday is in my investment course. I would like to present to you your next guest speaker, Thomas Sunderborn. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Gators, good afternoon. Again, my name is Tom Sunderborn. I'm the Vice President of Land Development and Management for the Mosaic Company. As, uh, as I was introduced, I'm uh, also a 1988 graduate of the University of Florida MBA program with a concentration in real estate and the uh, proud father of two sons at UF now. I'm here today to share with you an update on the Streamsong Resort Project. A Streamsong is uh, being developed and is owned by the Mosaic Company. And let me tell you a minute about who Mosaic is. Mosaic is the world's largest combined producer of phosphate and potash. Phosphate and potash are two of the three primary ingredients in fertilizer, or we like to say crop nutrients. Mosaic was formed in 2004 as a new public company through the merger of Cargill Crop Nutrition Division and IMC Global. Now Mosaic's sincere noble and important mission is to help the world grow the food it needs. The basic fundamentals of our business are really pretty simple. The world's population continues to grow and will increase by about 2 billion people in the next 35 years. At the same time, the amount of land available for agriculture worldwide is essentially flat. To feed the world's growing population, we need to increase the yield on available agricultural acres, and crop nutrition is the best way to do that. So Mosaic has about 8,000 employees in 40 countries around the world. 3,300 or so of those folks are in Florida. And in Florida, Mosaic primarily mines and processes phosphate. We also have five mines and, and a large production capability in Saskatchewan where Mosaic produces potash. And our corporate headquarters are in Plymouth, Minnesota, which is a northwestern suburb of Minneapolis. 
Mosaic is also the seventh largest landowner in the state of Florida. We own more than 250,000 acres, primarily in five counties in south central Florida. We also have another 80,000 or so acres of land where we have mining rights. So what is the most frequently asked question, and obvious question, is why would a fertilizer company hire a career real estate developer like me, take this kind of investment risk, stray a long way from its core business, and develop a new resort in south central, what some would call middle of nowhere, Florida? Well, I give our, our board of directors and our senior, senior leaders a lot of credit for having the vision and frankly the guts to take this risk. But when you think about it, and I'll try to explain it to you, it makes all the sense in the world. First, we have a beautiful, spectacular piece of land, which I'll tell you a lot more about today. Second, we own a lot of land in Florida, which I mentioned. But we own that land primarily because of the phosphate reserves that are underground. The future of our company and the accomplishment of our mission to help feed the world is dependent on our, our ability to get at those mining reserves. And that depends on our ability to get the necessary permits to mine those lands going forward. Also, reclaimed land doesn't add much to local tax base, and it really doesn't produce any new jobs. So addressing those key problems and delivering a great product with a return of and a return on investment for our company is really what Streamsong is all about. So the basic rationale for the Streamsong project is as follows. We want to show the world what we can do with reclaimed land. We want to change the perception of mining from a permanent to a temporary land use. We want to demonstrate both environmental and economic sustainability. We want to create a showplace that Mosaic, the phosphate industry, and our Central Florida neighbors will be proud of. We also want to offer an authentic Central Florida experience. And no disrespect to some of my former employers and neighbor neighborhoods where many of us live, we're trying to create an alternative to the frenetic theme park environment in the resorts of Central Florida and also an alternative to what is largely a congested coastal high-rise district that dominates our, our beaches. What we're, what we're creating is a calm, quiet, and elegant retreat in a part of South Central Florida that most Floridians don't even know. And also at the same time, we're reinforcing Mosaic's long-term commitment to our Central Florida neighbors by boosting the rural regional economy providing hundreds of construction jobs, providing hundreds more permanent jobs, increasing the local tax base, providing tax base that wasn't there before, providing jobs that weren't there before, and stimulating the multiplier effect in the local economy. So what is Streamsong? Streamsong is a destination luxury resort. It's composed of this, these programmatic elements. There are two golf courses, a fantastic clubhouse, 228 rooms, 216 of which are in a main lodge, and 12 more in the clubhouse itself. It's about 18,000 total square feet of conference facility and other amenities that include a spa, restaurants, bars, pools, shooting sports, and the best bass fishing in the state of Florida. It is right, on, right outside of the hotel. So where is it? If you look at this map, I hope you can all see this. Um, the, the airports are, are indicated there in red, so it's about an hour and a half from the Orlando airport. It's exactly an hour from the Tampa airport, a little bit less from Sarasota, and about 20, 25 minutes straight south of Lakeland. So this is a map of all the land that Mosaic owns or controls. It's primarily in five counties of Hillsboro, Polk, Manatee, Hardy, and DeSoto. The yellow rectangle is the Streamsong property, and that's so that all of the green and the yellow is 250,000 acres. The yellow is 16,000 acres. And that yellow parcel has been rezoned in Polk County under the uh, uh, classification called the Brewster Special Area Plan. It looks like, like that. 
And in the, in the lower left is what I call the resort core of about 4,000 acres that includes the program elements that I went through a minute ago. So the star, I'm not sure where the pointer is, but the star in the center top is where the lodge is, right on a beautiful lake. And you can see the golf course in the, uh, golf course is plural, uh, in the aerial photograph with the clubhouse in the lower right. So for any golfers in the room, um, I've selected some of, my, of the best photos. We are open. We open the golf and the clubhouse um, right before Christmas. I want to take you through, I, I don't want to bore you with photos, but these are pretty spectacular. And, and those who know golf and know golf in Florida hopefully will appreciate how unique and different these golf courses are. Um, first, a few uh, photos of the red course. Uh, this was designed by Bill Coor and Ben Crenshaw. Uh, the other course, the blue course, uh, was designed by Tom Doak. Um, both of these guys are at the absolute top of their games. They are, I think they are the best golf architects working in the world. The current rankings bear that out. And their work on this project has been nothing short of spectacular. So this is a Stream Song Red, opening part four. Th these are actual photographs. This is uh, number two, long part five. And this is all formerly mined land. Everything you see in every one of these pictures has been mined. Number five red, six red, 14, I'm gonna show you 14 through 18 red here, which I'll, I'll make my own bold statement. I, I think the finish of the red golf course, 14 through 18, is the strongest finish in golf that I've ever seen anywhere. Starts with this par three, 14, 15, and that big blowout bunker on the left was actually there. That wasn't a feature that we created. We cleaned it up a little bit, but it was just there. And that's, that's consistent with these, these golf course architects' uh, design philosophy, which they call minimalism. It's almost like uh, sculpture, where you just uncover the golf courses that were already there. And when you have spectacular, mostly sandy sites like this, that's possible. So that bunker was already there. 16, par three over the water. 17, believe it or not, is a real photograph of a sunrise. I mean, if you fell out of a helicopter and landed on that site, where would you think you were? We never get, we ask that question a lot, we never get Florida. You know, that could be, that could be Pine Valley. 18, it's a long par five that finishes back up at the base of that dune. And that dune is probably 100 feet high. The photography just uh, flattens it out a bit, but it is unbelievably spectacular. The other course, Blue One, starts on top of that dune that I just showed you. That, that's the back tee on number one. Again, the uh, photography flattens it all out, but that, the tee box here is about 75 feet above the level of the fairway. Three blue, again over over water, a lot harder than it than it actually, or it looks a lot harder than it actually is. Five is a tricky, devilish par three. You know, don't big, it just drops right off the off the edge on the left. It's blue seven. Um, we get the question a lot of what's your signature hole, and both architectural teams are just allergic to that question, and we are too. Um, this hole is probably the most photogenic, but we don't have signature holes. Every one of the 37 holes is, uh, is fantastic. This is a, another shot of that same hole, seven blue, but includes 16 red, and it's a shot down, down this uh, canyon um, with the clubhouse at the far end of the lake. You just barely see it in this photo. Blue eight. Blue 12. Again, I, I picked these, these photos to show you not just how spectacular this land is, but also uh, what we didn't do. In, in, you, know, you, you don't see paved cart paths. You don't see buildings. 
You'll see houses lining up and down the fairways. You'll see ball washers. And this, this, there, a lot of this project was an exercise in restraint of, of what we didn't do. Out of respect for the land and, and this specific place, we made a lot of decisions that are just specific to this setting that wouldn't be appropriate in other places. But imagine what, I mean, I'm a, I'm a career real estate developer, restraining myself from putting hotels and condos and townhouses all over this property, but, but doing that would absolutely ruin that image. 13, 18. The clubhouse is at the end of, uh, just beyond the, the green on 18. And it, the clubhouse is another example of how intentional and unconventional we were just about everything to do with this project. So that the, the, the minimalist design philosophy starts with the, with the golf courses, but it extends to everything about the land plan. The, the two, the only, we only have two buildings, the hotel and the clubhouse. But, but this clubhouse, let me uh, catch up to you all here. That's the view of the clubhouse from the number one blue tee, looking, looking back at it. Um, the clubhouse is beautiful. It was designed by Alfonso Architects out of Tampa. I'm not sure if Carlos is here, um, but uh, when he gets here, if you, if you like it, please congratulate him on this. Most golf clubhouses are um, they're like castles from a, from a land planning point of view. They command the high ground so that from the, from the castle you're shooting down on your enemy or from the, the analogy extends to from the clubhouse you want long views of the golf course. And, and the opposite is that you, you want to see the clubhouse as a landmark from the courses. So you, you play away from the clubhouse and then you play back to or you play out and in. This is where you get the, the standard nomenclature on a scorecard. We chose to do the opposite with this clubhouse, where we intentionally pushed it down into the ground. You only see the clubhouse from a very few places on the, on the golf course, because the star of this show is not the clubhouse, it's not the buildings, it's that landform. And out of respect for the dunes, which are incredibly, unbelievably um, beautiful, if you haven't, I'd encourage you all to go out and see them. Um, the, a building that, that would dominate, would sit up on top like a castle, would take away from this. So it, is, the, the, it, was, a, it was a risky move from a planning point of view, but it, it has turned out fantastically. And the, the unexpected benefit was that it is in its own little uh, micro environment there in this canyon that was created by the mining operation. Um, that's uh, the back patio, that's the front. And I, when I showed this to my wife, she said, when are you gonna finish the landscaping? I said, that is the landscaping. We, we restrained our, like, just like I said on the golf course, we, we held back from the things, the conventional wisdom about golf of ball washers and cart paths and carts all over the place. We didn't plant any trees. Not a single flower, but it is beautiful with the native grasses and, the, and the, the way that the native grasses are gonna come right up to the building. There's no landscaping other than those, those little uh, shoots there are transplanting native grasses from probably 100 yards away from the building. The inside is warm and elegant, a lot of stone, a lot of wood, but it's not stuffy. So this is the couple images of the lobby. The restaurant, called Restaurant 59. It's a steakhouse theme, does four meals a day, starting with breakfast. Um, it's a casual breakfast, it's a great lunch. Uh, goes all the way to fine dining in the evening. And the, the Restaurant 59 name I won't, I won't uh, torture you with that. It's just the, the lowest score ever recorded on a, in a sanctioned PGA Tour event. The clubhouse also has 12 rooms. That is a standard uh, double queen. It's original art in every room and a collection of golf books uh, that have to do, or every one of the 12 guest rooms is named for a classic uh, golf course architect. 
not the uh, architects that, that you all would probably um, imagine we'd use, but the architects that were inspirational for this kind of design and these, these particular architects, all the way from old Tom Morris to Pete Dye to A.W. Tillinghast and C.B. McDonald and, and those kinds. Bathrooms are modern and stone, mostly stone. There's a private game room upstairs that are, have uh, exclusive access by the 12 guest rooms. Like I said, we are open. We open right before Christmas. Uh, bookings have been off the charts. Uh, the courses have been full. We've hosted some major events, not, not, not uh, tour events, but uh, major events already. Uh, so far, things have gone really, really well. And the, the other thing about being out in, in a location like this is that, and also in a location where we own everything around it, there's no other development as far as you can see in every direction. So the night sky is unbelievably full of stars. And that's part of our attraction is that it's quiet, there's no light pollution, there's no noise other than an occasional train whistle. Um, you probably can't see it in this uh, with the lighting in here, but that, that night sky is just mesmerizing. So, so far, the, the press has been very positive, really generous. Um, Florida Trend uh, did an article on us in August of last year, long before we were open. Uh, we made the cover of PGA Magazine, again, two months before we were open. Um, Global Golf Post uh, wrote a very nice article on us uh, two months before we were open. Uh, you can't read it here, but Brian Hewitt said, this is a mystical place. Looks nothing like this state has ever seen before. Golf World in December wrote, Streamsong isn't your average Florida golf. There are no houses by the fairways, and the land gives it a linksy, dunesland feel. Golf Magazine, Joe Passov, who's a tough customer in December, said, gas up the car and make the trip. There's nothing else like it in the Sunshine State or anywhere else for that matter. The Orlando Sentinel. Jeff Shane said, it looks like the Irish coast, or Scotland, or remote Oregon, or the Nebraska Sandhills. Lynx Magazine. Jim Frank said, my advice is to get there soon before this incredible facility turns up on everyone's radar. And then maybe the thing we're so proud of, uh, most proud of so far is um, before we were even open, which I think is unprecedented, Golf Magazine named Streamsong Red the best new US course you can play, and Streamsong Blue the runner up. So these, these courses have been open now for six weeks. And we're, we try not to say it out loud other than I can't, can't help myself right now, but I think we're going to be ranked in the, as the top resort up against probably TPC Sawgrass the, at our first opportunity to be rated, which is a pretty good company. So let me tell you, so the, the golf and the clubhouse are open. The lodge is under construction. Again, it's right where that star, that red star is at the top. This is a current uh, construction photo of a couple weeks ago. Um, as a developer, it's awful nice to see construction cranes again. We've got two on that horizon. It's been a while. That's what it's going to look like. Close up. That feature on top is a rooftop bar. That We'll have amazing, I think that's a sunrise, it'll have amazing sunsets. The sun sets right over a lake that, that is uh, uh, situated on purpose. Uh, and again, the stars in this location will just be fantastic. So image of the main lobby. The ballroom, 
where maybe we can have this forum someday. Fine dining restaurant. The uh, three meal or more casual restaurant. By the way, the, uh, the fine dining restaurant is going to be named Soto Terra. This is called A Higher Ground, which is a, uh, a bit of a, a reference to a book called, um, now I just forgot. I thought it would come back to me in a second. All about the history, it's a fictional history of, of Central Florida, it's fantastic. The, the guest rooms in the lodge are a little bit bigger than they are in the, in the clubhouse. They're not quite the size of a suite, but they all have this extra sitting area, so that TV is a double-sided TV. Uh, one side faces the bed, the other side faces the seating area, and all rooms have these floor-to-ceiling windows that overlook uh, the landscape and, and this beautiful lake. This is an actual photograph of a mock-up room. The other, the few of the previous images were computer renderings. This is an actual photo. So it takes a big team to build a project like this, as you know. Um, Mosaic is the owner and the developer. The, again, the red course architects are Coor and Crenshaw. The blue uh, was done by Tom Doak. Alfonso Architects out of Ybor City are the architects of the lodge and the clubhouse. Uh, the civil engineers, Kimberly Horn out of Lakeland, general contractors, PCL. Uh, operations is a question we also get. Um, one of the promises that I made to the board of directors when I went to them for the funding of this project, I made three promises that I deliver it on time and on budget. Standard real estate developer promise. Um, that we would not, the second was uh, that, we would, w w that we would not hire uh, any individual employees, uh, which we've been true to, and the third was that we would not presume to operate this place ourselves. And we have not. We, we spent an entire year to go out in the world and find the best operating partners, and we have. Uh, the golf will be is, is currently being operated by Kemper Sports out of Chicago, doing a great job. And the uh, the overall management contract, uh, which includes all the lodging and the golf, is by Interstate Hotels and Resorts. So the uh, again the 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 golf and the clubhouse opened in December. We had a grand opening in January. Uh, our schedule, which we are on schedule to uh, hit substantial completion on the lodge by October, have a soft opening around Thanksgiving, and open uh, in, or have a grand opening in January of 14. I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes, sir. Promise number two uh, was just that we wouldn't, we wouldn't hire any employees that everybody, all the, all the staff would be contracted. Yes, sir? Room rates. <laughs> uh, currently, $360 a night. Does not include golf. Does not include golf. Golf rate right now, the walking rate is 175 plus a cart, plus a caddy. By the way, I didn't mention, we have a very robust caddy program. We have about 75 caddies at your service right now, doing a great job. Been a while since we built a resort. There's got to be some questions. Yes, sir. Are, are there plans for additional courses? Uh, great question. Um, as you saw, we have a lot of land. Got a lot of ideas. Um, I would love to, and the company would love to, but, but we are slow. We're going to walk before we run. Uh, we've got some sites picked out, but uh, no plans imminent. And I'm, I'm not working on it while I'm trying to get the hotel built. But thanks for asking. Yes? Just a comment. I have to show in the beginning of January with a group of friends, and it was astounding. It was one of the best experiences I've ever had. Very important. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Come back. Yes, sir. With all the land, no residential development? We have a little bit of residential entitlement, uh, but I'm going to hold on to that for some employee housing, maybe some caddy housing. But no, there, there's, um, there's not a great market for it out there. I mean, it's, it's pretty remote. 
and the closest towns of, of Fort Meade and Wachula and Bowling Green, they're really not expanding that we're in the path of development or anything like that. When Streamsong is over, uh, part of my job as, as Vice President of, of Land Management will be to master plan all of, all of Mosaic's land holdings. And I intend to find some residential opportunities, but they probably won't be near the resort. Yes, sir. Get a, get a mic right here. Excuse me. As far as being a mine area, is there any issues as far as environmental or radon or anything like that you have to deal with? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any disturbance of, of the ground uh, releases radon. Um, fortunately, on this particular site, the, the, most of the mining was done decades ago. Um, so those, those I'm, I'm not an environmental scientist, but we, we did the tests. Uh, the levels are far below anything to be concerned about, and, and we didn't have any environmental challenge on that. Yes, sir? Is there any truth to the rumor that all the attendees of this conference get a complimentary round of golf? <laughs> no, that's not true, but maybe uh, we can talk later. What's Mosaic's model in this thing with the uh, land that they have that's already been reclaimed and it's redone? And did you have any basis in this uh, in, the, in this land, or is it kind of zeroed out as you know just uh, conservation land, et cetera, after you've uh, completed all your mining and everything? Sure, fair fair question. Um, and in case anybody else is wondering, I'll just tell you right up front. I'm not at liberty to tell you what the budget is, um, but no, the, the basis was very close to zero. In in fact, we took a little bit of credit for. Um, so part, of, part of the project, uh, in fact, the first six holes of the red course were, were mined about two and a half years ago. And by law, uh, all mining lands have to be reclaimed. So as part of our golf course permitting, we, we convinced the agencies that the redevelopment of the land was the reclamation plan. So we took that money that we had escrowed for the reclamation plan and used it to build the golf course. Most of it. Um, but that, that permitting strategy was radical at the time. The agencies had no idea that it's never been done before, didn't know what we were talking about, but we prevailed. So that's part of what we're trying to do. I went through that slide about rationale. What, what do we want to do? We want to show the world what we can do with reclaimed land, that it's, that it's mining is temporary, that look what you can get after. Not that every time we're going to build a, you know, a high-end luxury resort, but the next one might be a, a farm or a, uh, you know, a port or a community or, or whatever the market demands, we'll have the capability to do it. But we, we've also now proven that, that redevelopment is, is reclamation. And that was a big step. Mr. Sonnenberg? Yes, sir. Over here. <laughs> are, are, are you tracking where your customers are coming from? And if so, what are you seeing so far? Uh, we are. We've only been open for six weeks or so, so I don't have, have reports, but just anecdotally, they're coming from all over the world. You know, we, had a, we had a group the other day from, from Seminole Country Club, which was, you know, that, that, was, that was pretty impressive. They're coming from, uh, from all over the country. Uh, we had people at our opening, uh, press especially from the UK. Um, this is an international destination for sure. Yes. Um, I couldn't help but notice you, you opened the golf course in January, but the hotel won't be finished for almost a year. Yes. And knowing the area where you are, you said you're quite remote. Is, was there some particular reason why the hotel is so far behind the golf course? Yes. There is. Um, we needed to do something to, to put our destination on the map and to, to open the golf early. The, the hotel isn't behind, the golf is early. <laughs> That's the truth. Um, we accelerated the golf in order to establish the destination. And this, this we, we call it euphemistically uh, remote but accessible. And, com and it is, compared to the places that, that we compare ourselves to, like Bandon Dunes in Oregon. And that, that is a commitment to go to Bandon Dunes. Um, Took me six hours to get there from Orlando. Um, 
if you want to go to Kohler, if you want to go to Hilton Head, if you want to go to I mean, the, the, the caliber of golf resort uh, that we're going to compete with, we're easier to get to than they are. I was on the, the number one uh, tee box with, uh, with a writer from New York the other day. And I wasn't selling, but he was just talking and I was listening. And he said, you know, I can leave Manhattan on the first flight and be on the, t on the, on the tee by 10.30. Yes, sir, you can. You can't, you, you can't do that at Bandon or Kohler or Hilton Head or Pebble Beach or St. Andrews. You can with Streamsong because we're so close to the, to the Florida airports. Uh, and the direct, so many direct flights in and out of Orlando. But we still needed to, to your question, sorry I'm rambling. We needed to establish the destination, the brand, and the best way to do that was to get the golf courses done, get the clubhouse open, no temporary clubhouse, permanent clubhouse, um, and, uh, and to, to really market the heck out of it, and we have. And then that's, not that golf is easy, but it's easier than the lodge and the conference business. But it's the, so the, the golf puts us on the map. It's the conference business at the lodge that drives the pro forma. So we had to, had to establish that destination first, make sure the meeting planners knew where we were and weren't taking a big risk to come there, that we were already there, and then open the hotel. And so far, that strategy is working. OK, well, I could talk about Streamsong all day, but uh, thank you for your attention. Go Gators.